Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Welcome. Uh, today we'll be talking about a third type of biosensors, one of the simplest, and I find it most interesting. And this is called uh, a cantilever-based sensor. It's essentially a mass sensor, and we'll understand or try to interpret the physics associated with this cantilever-based mass sensors today. So I'll begin by uh, with a basic introduction that how does this particular sensor uh, compare with the two previous types of sensors that we have talked about. And then I'll explain briefly how the sensor actually works. Uh, but this will be qualitative, uh, qualitative discussion. The real discussion, quantitative discussion, would be uh, on uh, the physics of linear biosensing. I'll explain the framework, theoretical framework, which is, uses this in order to measure the mass of biomolecules. And today we'll focus on dynamic biosensing, that if you have a mass-based sensor, then this particular technique will use oscillation of the of a cantilever beam in order to measure, measure the mass. In the next lecture, we'll talk about static deflection. Uh, so let's get started uh, before, uh, and, and then of course we'll, we'll conclude. Now, uh, let me briefly remind you that we had been talking about uh, three types of sensors, potentiometric sensors, essentially a camera for the charge. So therefore, this one, the charge of the biomolecule, yellow biomolecule, changes the channel potential. And as a result, the current flow from the source to the drain changes, reflecting that the biomolecule has arrived. Similarly, an amperometric sensor, which is like a glucose sensor that we have discussed in the last three lectures, essentially uh, identifies when a molecule has landed on the working electrode by changing the current flow through the circuit. So this would be the working electrode, uh, that could be the counter electrode, and we have seen that because of the redox reaction associated with this arrival of the biomolecule, the current changes, and that allows us to detect, detect the presence of the biomolecule. So it's, uh, it's in, in some way, it is a camera for electron affinity. The mechanical biosensors that we'll be discussing today measures the mass of a biosensor when the biomolecule arrives on a cantilever, let's say, or a spring mass system, the mass of the molecule changes, the mass of the suspended beam changes, as we'll explain in a second, and this particular sensor can measure the mass of the arriving biomolecules, thereby essentially identifying the molecule itself. Now, what type of mass are we really talking about? How small are these things? Especially because in nanobiosensing, we are used to dealing with, you have seen so far, very, very small masses. So the masses we are talking about, remember a single molecule of glucose, the small molecules, is about 180 Daltons per molecule, or about 0.3 zeptogram. Per base pair of DNA is 300 Dalton, or about 0.5 zeptogram. And if you have a, a DNA which is 100 base pair long, then you can see that this would be essentially 50 zeptogram. So we are talking about extremely small masses. As you go to a larger molecule per amino acid, that's the AA, is 125 Daltons. You may have 200, 300 amino acid in a particular protein. So you can see again a zeptogram on the hundreds of zeptogram level masses. Now once you get to viruses or bacteria, things become much larger, megadaltons, tens of atograms, picograms, and a human cell can be as large as a nanogram. So therefore, these mass-based, cantilever-based sensors generally can detect these 
nanogram to picogram level uh, 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 materials relatively easily. But once you get to this very low level, very low concentration, it requires a, some other amplification before the molecule can be detected. But it turns out theoretically, at least in vacuum, one should be able to measure hundreds of zeptogram level, uh, uh, level masses using this sensor technology. So therefore, this is an extremely sensitive uh, nanosense, nanobiosensors. Now, why do we care about uh, nanobiosensors? Remember uh, our cantilever-based uh, nanobiosensors? Remember, I told you that there are many biosensors, right? Optical biosensors, optics-based biosensors, various level-based biosensing technology. One of the key thing that makes this uh, cantilever sense uh, base sense is very attractive is that we don't need any reference electrode. Remember, we are measuring mass. And so therefore, there's no current flow involved. And so we don't need these electrodes, the extra electrodes which are necessary for potentiometric or amperometric sensors. And therefore, we can miniaturize, miniaturize them far more effectively. Uh, also, there is no salt necessary directly uh, and so therefore, the charge screening, salt is necessary, of course, in order for the binding to occur. However, the, we are, since we are not measuring the charge associated with the DNA molecule, the screening doesn't matter. Screening is there, but screen doesn't matter because we are just measuring the added mass associated with the biosensor. And therefore, and also it goes very well with various nanofabrication technology. And so therefore you can miniaturize them, put hundreds of them or thousands of them in parallel. So therefore, this is a ideal technology for nanobiosensing. Of course, the other problem, generally pro general problems associated with settling time, that how long the molecules would take before it lands on the sensor surface. Well, that is independent of what type of sensor you use. And so therefore, cantilever sens sensors will have the same limitations as we discussed uh, other sensors have. Now, selectivity is as an issue because you see, if you have a uh, mass-based sensor, and if two proteins have exactly same masses and they land on the sensor surface, then you will not be able to differentiate them. And so just like potentiometric sensors had this selectivity problem, will something that we'll discuss in the next set of lectures, uh, this one has similar selectivity problem. So let's, let me explain how uh, this biosensors look like. Uh, if you look at this particular uh, cantilever, say hanging cantilever so connected to a substrate, and when a biomolecule lands on the sensor surface, just like a springboard or a diving board, uh, when somebody stands on the end, the cantilever bends. So you can see this diving board-like configuration. And once the biomolecule, and here it's a virus, once the biomolecule sort of here lands on the sensor surface, then it will change the deflection, change the oscillation, resonant frequency, something that we'll discuss in a few minutes. And as a result, this added mass is reflected in the shift in the frequency of these cantilevers, the oscillation frequency of these cantilevers, and that allows us to detect its mass. Remember, this is a virus particle. It's a very, very small, small mass, and still the sensor is sensitive enough to detect a single virus molecule. Now, the size of the sensor, well, it's about, width is about, in this case, about a micron, two micron, couple of microns in length, so on the micron size. But the real nanoscale features comes in the thickness. The thickness is only about 25 to 50 nanometer. And so that gives, as we'll see, huge sensitivity of this slice of sensors. Now, how do you measure the deflection? Well, what you do, is essentially once the biomolecules have landed, you bounce off a laser beam and use a photodetector to measure, measure the location. Remember, when the cantilever was flat, in that case, after bouncing the light, it will sort of, it will land somewhere on the screen of the photodetector. And after it has bent, 
or once it begins oscillating, then of course this one will move back and forth on the detector array and from there you can essentially calculate what the resonance frequency is or how much the deflection has, how much deflection has taken place. Now of course this cantilever need not be one. As I said that you can miniaturize them and put many of them in parallel. So here I show you an array. It's a beautiful example of an array, cantilever array, where you can see this, all these springboards are in parallel. So if you use different receptors for each one of these diving board, quote unquote, in that case, you'll be able to detect different molecules in parallel in solution using this cantilever based sensors. Now, very simply, uh, the deflection, measurement of deflection is a very important thing in here. And this measurement of deflection it could be static deflection or it could be the resonant frequency, change in the resonant frequency. And so you can do it optically at, as I just explained by bouncing off the laser. And so thereby this deflection is change in the position in the photodetector is proportional to the amount of deflection you have. That's one way. But the integration of a laser and a corresponding photodetector could be bulky, right? Could be difficult to miniaturize. Other methods are also possible. For example, this is a cantilever. You can see a U-shaped cantilever hanging just like a springboard. But now, if you use a piezoelectric material which, whose resistance changes when it is lengthened or shortened, in that case, after the biomolecule has landed on the cantilever, it will bend a little bit and that will change along the green line, the resistance associated with it. And thereby you can also detect whether a biomolecule has landed or not by simply looking at the resistance. And finally, you can also look at the capacitance. So if you have a bottom plate and the top cantilever, so you know epsilon naught A over D, that D is the gap, and once the molecule has landed, the D will become smaller, the capacitance will change. And by reading of the capacitor, you can also say whether a biomolecule has landed or not. Now, in many cases, uh, you will set the, uh, uh, the cantilevers in oscillation simply by applying a voltage. And generally, you can always measure the capacitor between the suspended beam which is shown here and the bottom electrode of a capacitor and by looking at the difference in the difference in the capacitance you can infer the change in delta y that must have occurred to give this response. Now how should you bring the biomolecule to the sensor, right? You, you can, one thing you can always do is to put the sensor and in the solution containing the analyte molecule, proteins or DNA, this type of thing, or the viruses, that's possible. In that case, it will be in the fluid. The biosensors will be within the fluid. The one problem with that, and that's why you difficult to detect less than a picogram, uh, of molecule is because this is in the fluid. So as it is trying to go back and forth, oscillate, then the oscillation will be damped by fluidic motion. And so there is, this is by the way, most common putting it in the fluid, in the fluidic channel and measuring, measuring the change in the capacitors or change in the piezoelectric response or looking at the optical deflection. But another one is very ingenious is to this is the cantilever. Once you again, you can see this is hanging within the, uh, within the, uh, as a springboard, but now the fluidic channel is embedded within the cantilever itself, cantilever itself. And so the biomolecules come from one, two, three, four, five. So it flows through it. And once this yellow biomolecule is there, it changes the mass of the cantilever and thereby changes the resonant frequency. But now this is, oscillating in air, so the damping is very good, very small, and therefore you can measure smaller amount of mass using this technique. All right, so this is the general way by which a sensor works. Now let me explain the physics of it in a little bit more quantitative terms. Now, 
Although the cantilever where the originally it was undeflected and the green layer is a selective layer which recognizes the molecule just like the DNA layer was present and the target DNA came and bound to it or an antibody might be present in order to catch that target bacteria or protein associated with it. That's the green layer which is the receptor layer. And then once the red biomolecules have come in, the mass has changed and the whole thing has deflected by amount delta S. Now the analysis of this cantilever is sort of difficult, right? You have to take a few classes uh, in mechanical engineering in order to, in order to understand how much deflection takes place. So I'll tell you a simpler way of doing it. In a simpler way, we'll think about this original system as this which is a spring mass system. It's just like a scale that you use in the supermarket to weigh a produce, for example, tomatoes and other things. You put it in and from the scale you see the weight of this, uh, of this produce that you're going to buy. So it's a simple spring mass system. It doesn't have the complication associated with it. And then once the biomolecule comes in, let's say it's uh, it, the deflection gets large. Initially it was why not? It has sort of deflected a little bit more. Now these are two are equivalent system of the cantilever. So therefore this equivalence, uh, we'll show the equivalence in a sec second. But in order to know the dynamics of this cantilever, you know, it's very easy. The first term here is the acceleration, M mass multiplied by the acceleration. And that's the force. And then the second term is gamma dy dt. This is the velocity multiplied by the damping coefficient. The faster it's trying to move, damping will try to prevent it. And the spring force, which is trying to pull things back, right, is k y naught y minus y naught. And this is the spring force, which is trying to push things back. So when you add these three terms in together, that will be equal to the external force associated. With it. In this case, for example, there's no external force, just the mass and Therefore, the sum of these three things must be equal to zero, let's say approximately. Or if you have a spring for external force, you can simply add to it. This is a general equation. Now, how does this equivalent circuit compare with the original cantilever? Assume that you have a cantilever of width W, length L, and height H. Now, remember, this was about a couple of micron, width was a couple of micron three, four microns in the previous example we saw, and H was how much? Like 25, 30 nanometer, very, very thin. Now, once you have this basic cantilever, it turns out you this equivalent mass that will allow you to go from the cantilever to the spring mass system equivalent is something like this. Rho B is the mass of the original cantilever. B stands for before, before the molecule has arrived. LWH is a volume. And so this is essentially weight of the weight of the cantilever. And 0.24 really comes from how the cantilever is suspended. We'll not worry too much about it. And so when you're solving this simple equation rather than this complicated equation, instead of M, we'll just put MB in that equation. Now, what about this K? Well, K is also simple. It is the Young's modulus that for every material, if it's made of silicon, we'll have a Young's modulus associated with it. We can just Google, Google it up. I is the moment of inertia, I'll explain. For the cross section, depends on the cross section of the beam. And L is the length, length Q. And I, before any molecule has arrived, is given by, for this rectangular thing, W is the width an H cube, the thickness cube. That's why if you make it very thin, if you make it very thin, then it really reduces the moment of inertia significantly. Now this factor of 12 comes from, again, a calculation that is in given any standard uh, strength of materials or uh, textbook. But we'll not get into that for the time being. Let's accept these equations. Now, once the biomolecule has sort of landed on the sensor surface, then afterwards, the height of the cantilever has sort of gotten a little bigger. In that case, that will be equal to plus delta H. So the mass will have increased. 
after the biomolecule has landed. Correspondingly, the spring will also change. Spring constant will also change. How? Because the height is no longer h, but h plus delta h. You know, half of the delta h is on the top, half is on the bottom because the cantilever is sitting in the fluid and biomolecule will come and attach both on the top surface as well as on the bottom surface. So I'm telling, I'm saying this delta h over 2 on either side. And so therefore Ia will also change and therefore the spring constant will also change. Now I'm not talking about gamma yet. We'll assume that gamma is relatively small. These things are happening. Uh, what were uh, happening in, in the air specifically? I'll talk about gamma a little bit later. So let's think about the ideal case where the gamma is relatively small. Okay, so let's start with a simple example. Uh, let's say I have no damping. I throw away gamma and I don't have any external force, continuous external force. So I take this spring on which the biomolecules have landed, give it a little push and let it oscillate and look at the resonant frequency or look at the frequency of oscillation, natural frequency of oscillation. How does it depend on the mass? Well, it's relatively simple. You see, once you, if you write y minus y naught as delta y, the change in the y, then you can see the first term y, you can write it as y plus del delta y, y naught is a constant. So once you take a derivative, that will go away. And the solution of this equation, you can write it in the form of a e to the power i naught omega t. Omega naught is the natural frequency of oscillation. So once you insert this delta y, expression for delta y into the, into the equation of motion, then you can immediately see once you solve it that the resonant frequency is given by k divided spring constant divided by the mass of the spring mass system under a square root. Now you may have seen this equation many times in your high school physics, uh, high school or college physics courses. And so therefore there's nothing surprising in this, in this particular formulation. So if you make the mass bigger, if you make the max bigger, uh, or the spring constant, uh, and if you imagine uh, the resonant frequency will decrease, and even also if you make it very, very stiff, the resonant frequency will increase. And so therefore, these are well-known quantities. So before the biomolecules have landed, we'll have Kb, the spring constant, before it comes in, and Mb is a mass of the cantilever before the biomolecule have landed, and afterwards, it will be a change spring constant and change ma. Now, by the way, what does it mean to have a change in the mass is easy to understand, but what does it mean to have a change in the spring constant? Well, change in the spring constant simply means that once the biomolecule has landed, that it has gotten sort of stiff, more stiff, difficult to oscillate as much as it used to be. Right? That will be the change in the spring constant. Anytime you take a shard and launder it, and then in that case, if you put starch on it, that changes the sort of the spring constant because sort of things have gotten more difficult to bend. And so that would be the corresponding change in the K is spring constant, Ka, uh, uh, after a biomolecule has landed. All right. Let's take a quick example. Let's say I have a silicon beam, 3 micron, width about a 1.5 micron, height 25 nanometer. It is silicon, so uh, the Young's modulus is about 70 gigapascal, density 2300 kilogram per meter cube. Put this values in, the alpha 1 is 0.24. Remember that constant that depends on the support of the cantilever. Uh, you calculate it you see this is a very small mass. This tiny springboard of a uh, is essentially about 63 femtogram. That's very, very small, this cantilever. That's why it's so sensitive. And correspondingly, you can calculate the spring constant by putting the values in. And you can see the 25 nanometer cube because H cube, remember? And this is the width and this is the corresponding um, uh, E, E is the Young's modulus, and once you put it in, you get about 0 0.01 Newton per meter. That's the spring constant associated with it. Again, relatively small, 
And that's primarily because this H is very small. It's very, very thin. So easy to bend compared to a thick cantilever. And if you put the, put the values in, you will see you will have a resonant frequency before the biomolecules come in on the order of a few megahertz. Now you can do a couple of things. You can, for example, you do, can do a mass only dynamic biosensing where you assume that the spring constant doesn't change. Let's assume that. And in that case, only the mass changes. So the mass after is equal to mass before plus the delta M. Delta M is equal to the mass of the biomolecule. And once you put it in and assume that spring constant has not changed, it's just an assumption. In that case, change in the resonant frequency is directly proportional to the change in the mass of the biomolecule. By the way, how do you get it? Get this expression, delta omega divided by omega b. You take a log, you take a log of this quantity and then take a differential. That will give you this particular relationship. And once you put these things in, you can immediately show, it takes a few lines of algebra, is that the shift in the resonant frequency after the biomolecule of mass delta m uh, has landed uh, depends on a bunch of constant associated uh, with the uh, with the cantilever itself, the cantilever properties, but it's directly proportional. Remember, it's no logarithmic dependence, as was the case for the potentiometric sensors, right? It's directly, linearly proportional. And how can you make this change significant? Well, you can make the width smaller, or you can make the length smaller, and thereby, you essentially can have a significant uh, increase in the differential change. And so there are many ways you can essentially make a cantilever-based biosensor very, very sensitive. You could go to the other extreme. You could say, well, um, mass is so small, the biomolecule mass is so small that that I can essentially ignore. And only the spring constant, you know, after you have coated it in the layer of biomolecules, it has gotten steeper, uh, stiffer. And that is the more dominant quantity. In that case, again, you will neglect the delta M, put all the constants in, assume this time the delta K change in the K is coming because of change in the H. So it is H plus delta H to the cube. And if you know delta K, that will be the differential, which will be three times delta H, you know, for small delta H. And the delta H will be proportional to the number of molecules you have, NS, area of individual biomolecules, right? You remember for the DNA or for the protein, we have certain specific sizes. And HT is the height of individual biomolecules. You put those things in, that will give you the delta H. And once you put the delta H in this expression, you will know the delta K. And once you know the delta K, you correspondingly will find the shift in the resonant frequency due to change in the stiffness alone. And so correspondingly, if you take some, you know, typical values, 20 nanometer H and the biomolecules is approximately 10 nanometer high, let's say, uh, and correspondingly calculate these numbers, then you will see spring constant can change by several percent, easily detectable by, uh, by uh, modern nanoscale uh, cantilever based sensors. In fact, experimentally, uh, people have seen, in fact, even 20 to 40 percent, uh, 10 to 40 percent change in K once the biomolecules have landed. And so there are, this is a significant effect. This is not a significant effect in large scale sensors. This is a significant effect in nanoscale sensors. The remarkable thing about nanoscale biosensors is that the frequency may increase or decrease depending on how many biomolecules have landed. I will explain that quantity, I explain that issue as a defining feature of nanoscale biosensors and then conclude. You see, if you have, there are certain experiments, if you go and measure in the lab certain experiments, let's say the amplitude versus frequency. This is the resonant frequency, means the natural frequency of oscillation, omega naught. That's what the peak is. Uh, 
and when the biomolecule has not arrived, is yet to arrive, then let's say you have this rate curve. After the biomolecule has arrived, then the curve may have shifted to the left. This is one experimental observation. But it turns out that a second student who has gone in the lab and waited for a little bit longer or with a slightly different sensor can see the opposite effect that in the beginning the peak was somewhere and afterwards the peak has actually increased. The resonant frequency actually has increased. What is going on? This would never happen in this type of reversal would never happen in a larger scale cantilever based sensors, but it happens at nanoscale. Well, what you can show, and I will explain in a second, that actually the frequency goes down like this if the biomolecule that has arrived on the sensor surface is not too high. So the delta H is small, let's say you have 20 nanometer or so, a thin coating. In that case, the frequency goes down. But if you wait a little bit longer and the delta H gradually builds up, then the frequency will reverse direction and will actually increase. So this is for a 5 micron uh, long cantilever. If you have a somewhat smaller cantilever, in fact, these effects will be even more actuated. Remember, delta omega is inversely proportional to the cube of the length of the cantilever. So once you make it actually smaller, these effects get even more actuated. So you can have negative or positive depending on the types of cantilever that you have used. And you have to sort of deconvolve it in order to get the mass of the biomolecule that you have captured. Now it turns out that uh, this frequency at which or this thickness at which this reversal occurs is given by a very simple formula. Delta H critical thickness is given by this simple formula. I'll derive it in the, in the next slide. But the bottom line is frequency goes down because of the mass effect. Frequency goes up because of the spring effect, spring constant effect, increase in the spring. And so therefore these two things are sort of balancing against each other at the nanoscale doesn't happen at the micro or millimeter length scales. How would you get the green point, the critical point? Very easy. You see, you know the resonant frequency before the molecule has captured omega naught b and after the uh, molecule has been captured omega naught a, equate them because at that point there would be no change in the resonant frequency. And if you equate them, then correspondingly, and you know all the expressions for mass before and mass after, which has increased by delta Hc, and the spring constant before and spring constant after, put them in together, and that will immediately give you the critical frequency with respect to the original uh, original thickness of the cantilever expressed in terms of the spring constant uh, density of the biomolecule and compared to the original density of the silicon cantilever as well as the spring constant before uh, I'm sorry the Young's modulus before and after. Put some values in and you will see about 20 or 30 nanometer by the time molecules have sort of collected 20 or 30 nanometer very very small actually the cantilever will behave as if very differently from compared to a scale that you use let's say in supermarket. So let me conclude then. In this first lecture we have talked about cantilever sensors how it measures mass and stiffness following the capture of biomolecules right K and M after the capture of biomolecules. And this, generally we always expect the frequency to decrease in a traditional cantilever based sensors. But at the nanoscale, it can go either way. And I explained to you how this spring constant and the mass essentially balanced against each other.
And one great thing about these uh, sensors is that we don't need reference electrodes. That's really a very important thing because it allows us to densely pack them. That's one of the features why uh, cantilever sensors are so, uh, so helpful. And, but the final thing you should always have to remember is that the diffusion limit and selectivity problems are still there. It's a great sensor, very sensitive, can measure a virus. Even people have been attempting to measure uh, proteins, individual proteins, but you see it's very difficult. These problems of selectivity and diffusion limit are still there, and so therefore will still be detected by this settling time limits. So let me stop here. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll talk a little bit more about static deflection associated with this cantilever. Until next time, take care.